Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're talking all about one of my favourite subjects, skin health and acne prevention or overcoming acne naturally using a really great skincare regime. My guest is Cheryl Woodman. Apologies Cheryl for mispronouncing your name as Cheryl in the episode, but I know now I'm just going to have to keep that in mind. So for those who don't know, Cheryl is a scientist, award-winning skincare formulator, skincare expert, writer, and creator of Honesty for Your Skin, and the online acne clinic, a one-to-one -one coaching practice where she helps people who have, quote, tried everything under the sun and feel stuck at rock bottom. And that she helps them find healthy, happy skin that they feel fantastic in. And she does this in a way which is more friend next door than bow tie wearing professor, which is great. She strongly believes that if you can understand the underlying biology changes of any skin condition, you can be empowered to take back control of your skin without medication. She believes in identifying the trigger causes of a skin condition and working with your skin's biology to promote long-term healing. So no quick fixes here. She's also been featured on BBC Radio, Witch Travel, Top Sante Magazine and The Huffington Post. Today we're going to be talking about the process that most people go through when they develop acne. So they start off with googling how to fix acne fast and they come up with all of these, some potentially useful, some downright dangerous um, DIY hacks. So we talk about things like benzoyl peroxide as well. Um, once people go to the pharmacy after that isn't working and there's actually a blog post in the episode show notes that um, Cheryl wanted everyone to check out because we couldn't talk on all of these points in too much detail. And then people tend to um, go to kind of drugstore brands and see and follow the Clarissa lines and all of these harsh stripping products. And then finally, they can go to the doctor and that's when they get put on the birth control pill, antibiotics, um, tretinoin, those types of things. So we're going to touch on some of these. This is a never ending conversation, by the way. So Cheryl is absolutely going to come back on at some point. And she was kind enough to review my skincare routine, which I found really useful. She obviously didn't need to go into the diet and the lifestyle type things for me. So she just give me a little snippet as to how she works. And I highly recommend anyone who's struggling with acne or maybe preventative, just wanting to make sure that they have good skin health long-term and prevent some of these um, issues, irritation, premature aging, because I believe that 80, 90% is internal factors, but that good 10 to 20% of a topical routine can make a world of a difference in just speeding up your recovery from breakouts or preventing the clogged pore in the first place and that is where breakouts do start with that clogged pore and inflammation um, in the in the skin so I'll just give you a bit of an overview as to what she shared with me obviously the products and things aren't going to be useful in your case because we have totally different needs my skin just for reference is oily and um, I've kind of got my acne under control with internal factors but some things like my environment and the whole mold situation it made my skin absolutely terrible and freak out so I think from February to June my skin was pretty bad that's where that was because of lockdown and being at home all the time and yeah just my body was a little bit inflamed and I had all of these histamine and mast cell reactions which was showing on my skin with lots of redness inflammation which I'd done a good job at keeping under control with supplements and detox support but I wasn't actually getting to the root cause of the problem. And I was kind of just managing those symptoms for a while. And as soon as I moved, I started documenting my skin improvement every two weeks. And I can see already before I even started working with um, Cheryl that there was a improvement happening. But hopefully with her help, and I'll eventually share these pictures with you, it's going to speed things up and just keep my skin great in the long run and prevent breakouts from coming back. So I sent her a list of my um, current concerns, which was congestion. Usually in the past, my breakouts have been around the chain jaw and a little bit onto the neck area and down like the sides of the goatee area of the face because of PCOS and high androgens when that was an issue. And histamine can also cause breakouts and inflammation in that area as well as gut health. 
but since the mold detoxification my skin did flare up for the first few weeks um particularly my cheeks which i never get an issue there and that does make sense that's kind of like internal factors and inflammation in the system can often come out in the cheek area and yes yeah, slowly my skin has been improving but i give her a list of products i was using and my main concerns oiliness on a scale of zero to ten acne severity zero to ten and then she obviously took that information i sent her pictures and she formulated some products for me based on what i was doing i do have a, a kind of um, product graveyard so i have a supplement graveyard of all of the things i've tried previously same with skincare i've got a ton of things that i eventually want to use up for certain things like moisturizers that don't work i'm just going to use them on my body or give them to friends and family instead because they if they don't have any issues with pore clogging or they're not super sensitive then they could probably tolerate some of them one of them was a, a i heard good reviews on it online saying it was lightweight and it was great for oily skin and um, acne prone skin and it was coconut water cream i'm familiar with the whole coconut oil situation and pore clogging ingredients but i thought this one probably been formulated correctly to not have that effect and it was made with coconut water as opposed to coconut oil so i thought oh it'd be fine i'll try that out but i really think that was causing a lot of congestion on my skin i personally don't tolerate oils at the moment i have in the past but whenever there's imbalances in the gut microbiome and yeast overgrowth in particular the yeast on the skin um, i can never say mesalea or something like that it's the one that causes um dandruff that can be overgrown in the skin adding oils on top of that even the non-pore clogging oils so grapeseed rosehip jojoba they can still feed that yeast and exacerbate breakouts so my my asks for Cheryl was as clean as possible but i'm not like super into everything completely natural because i know that there are some ingredients that are chemicals and that's absolutely fine water is a chemical at the end of the day so ideally hormone disruptor free um oil free if possible and i was happy to spend kind of whatever is needed on my skin i don't really have a budget for my body or my health care my supplements i take what's needed but she would cater a skincare routine based on your needs so like low value medium value or high value products so she pointed out that the coconut cream that i was just mentioning coconut water cream yes it had the coconut products that could be pore cloggers but she was actually more concerned with the glucose and another ingredient in there they can actually feed bacteria as well they're like food for bacteria so that was one of the top ingredients in there and she said for someone with acne prone or congested skin you want to avoid certain products like that so i'm glad that she pointed it out because i can obviously take that information long term with me and avoid some of those things in the past i've also tried the whole not washing your face thing in the morning and it did actually work but for some reason i think from the start of the year i started washing my face again and that actually correlated with more oiliness throughout the day and i completely forgot about the benefits my friend sarah sumik has mentioned before about not washing your face and how that can help with just keeping the skin barrier healthy in the long run and the ph correct because if you're even just splashing your face with water first thing in the morning that is a neutral ph around seven our skin should be slightly acidic around 4.2 to about 4.5 uh, i think so it should be more acidic so um cheryl recommended not using a cleanser in the morning because she thinks that was causing my skin to be a little bit more stripped and then that produces oil as like a rebound effect so instead i'm going to just do a toner in the morning followed by a niacinamide and a zinc and b5 serum sorry and then a really lightweight gel moisturizer and she said that that is going to um, be a lot lighter on the skin and just prevent that excessive oiliness and zinc is really good at controlling oil too she's also Kind of easing me into a retinol routine retinol is a derivative of vitamin a and it's really important for anti-aging skin cell turnover so clogged pores and things like that and um dry skin it can be a result of your skin cells not shedding people can develop this on the back of their arm as well with um keratosis pilaris so that can happen kind of similar on the facial skin as well so 
you need to, you can't just go into like the really high strength retinols and I wouldn't recommend starting this too young unless acne is a concern. If you've got normal skin, then you may not need to start a retinol, retinol. but I'm going to do it for the acne prevention, the congestion and just anti-aging long term. I am 25, but I'm really into skin health. So I want to be looking as young as possible um, long term. In the evening, she's recommended another gel moisturizer to so keeping things really nice and light with it being summer as well. And my skin being oily and producing these lipids on its own. I may not need something heavy like a night cream that would actually make my skin worse. So the gel moisturizer she suggested has got anti redness and anti inflammatory properties because, particularly under kind of my eyes and that upper cheek area, I sometimes get a little bit of irritation there if I've used a chemical exfoliant too often or if I eat something that doesn't agree with me I get like little hives or little bumps she was asking whether it was rosa rosacea I'm not too sure whether it is or not um to be honest I'm not really concerned because it's not that frequent and I don't really need a diagnosis I know what my triggers are so I'm going to keep them at bay she also asked me to list some products I was using on occasion so I wrote down my Manuka honey masks and she said they were fine. Um, and another one was Aztec, Aztec healing clay. It's like a really common thing that people get and it's got thousands of reviews online. People claim that it's like cured their skin issues. So recently I've been adding that back in just what, since I've moved just to see if that helps. And like straight away afterwards, I can tell like definitely less oiliness and my skin looks a little bit better. There can be a little bit of a purging aspect to that as well it's kind of drawing or sucking out any impurities from the skin but she put it on the no list so she does like a good green an uh, okay amber color and then like a red no stop if possible and she was saying the aztec healing clay was like a no-go because it gives you temporary results so this is similar to some of the things that she was mentioning like baking soda and um, tea tree in today's podcast episode and she was saying that it actually makes your skin very alkaline, which isn't great. We want our skin to be mildly acidic, as I mentioned before. And so I'm actually going to throw that one away or just use it elsewhere on the body. Some people do like armpit masks with that one just to kind of clear out the pores in the armpit area as well. That's a good thing when you're transitioning to a more natural deodorant. Um, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but she recommended for me, um, I think it's kaolin clay and colloidal oatmeal she said there would be better alternatives for my skin type so yeah i'm gonna be tracking my progress making note that i am already improving anyway without her support so this is just going to be an additional add-on i need to introduce one thing every three weeks or so just to let my skin calm down and get used to them before i make any decisions or add too many things at once that's a common mistake i'm going to do patch testing as always and I will definitely have Cheryl on for a part two at some point because the this is like the never ending subject, skin health. I've got endless amount of questions for her. And at that point, I'll give you a bit of an update as well about my progress and how I found everything, being totally honest. Uh, so if you want to get help from Cheryl with your acne or preventative anti-aging routine, whatever, then you can reach out to her. All of her details will be in the episode show notes. And let's get into the podcast because I know that you're really going to love this one. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I know the background is a little bit different to what you're used to if you're watching on YouTube. And I am very sweaty right now because we're in the middle of like a mini heat wave at the end of June 2020. And I've just moved into my new apartment and the, the windows are like absolutely huge and there's no blinds up. So I am dripping with sweat, unfortunately. Um, and I'm in my bed, so I'm not, not being lazy. This is the only room that's um, good for sound at the moment. And we're talking all about skincare, acne. Some of the most common episodes that have been downloaded are on this subject. So I know that a lot of people are struggling it's something near and dear to my heart. Acne was like one of the worst symptoms that I ever dealt with. And I know that people are like constantly searching for answers online. And I want to make sure that I bring experts and guests on who really know their stuff and it's information and advice that you can trust. 
So today's guest is Cheryl. Welcome Cheryl to the podcast. Hello, I'm excited to be here. Me too. I can never, I'm always open to talk about acne. So when you sent me a message, you wanted to chat about skincare, I was like, absolutely. But I wanted to make sure that we'd not covered certain subjects before because I know my guest, Sarah Sumik, who's been on several times. Um, she's kind of a skincare expert as well. So we went through and came up with some different things that haven't yet covered. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how certain skincare brands or products or routines can actually be making your acne worse. And Cheryl is going to go through with the typical kind of protocol that people follow when the skin starts to break out. So there's kind of like four steps and four phases. You've probably been through this yourself if you are struggling. So you've probably been nodding along as we go through like, yeah, I've done that. That didn't work. So we're going to talk about those things. So kind of like overnight um, hacks that people make, like home, homemade skincare products, some of which can be good if you use the right ingredients. But sadly, a lot of people use very drying, stripping, irritating ingredients. And then Cheryl's going to give us a bit about her approach to formulating a skincare routine and what to look for when purchasing brands and products um, for your skin. So first, Cheryl, before we get into all of that, could you introduce yourself a little bit more and give us an idea as to what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so what I do now, I help people with acne get to the root trigger causes of their acne and to heal their skin. And why I do what I do is really because of personal experience with my own skin. I really, really struggled with acne probably about seven to eight years ago now. And I had never had bad skin as a teenager, so it kind of came out of the blue. And I didn't really have any experience of, of how to help my skin heal. And at the time I was in kind of a, a climb the career ladder corporate job, and my skin really got to me just being sat in corporate meetings feeling like like my skin was just an oil slick that makeup was rolling down my face and that all these kind of cystic acne mounds on my chin just meant people weren't going to take me seriously and it, it it kind of really I don't think it's something people understand unless you've ever suffered with a skin condition yourself how it can affect your self-confidence because yeah it's only the outside it's only kind of your packaging but it really impacts how you feel inside. And I struggled for, for a long, long time with it, not really knowing what to do. And I don't know whether you get this as well, but um, say you're down the pub with friends and there's a quiz night on. And um, so I'm a scientist and I've always been a scientist. And the science round comes on, maybe for you it's biology. The science round comes on and all your friends are like, Cheryl, this is your round. You're gonna know the answer to this. <laughs> and I'm there like, ah! okay um and all of a sudden the question something like what tree only grows in peru in the month of july and my friends are like cheryl what's the answer and i'm like oh geez i don't know you should know um, everything about every science subject yeah exactly so i was a scientist which means i have training which helps me to understand other areas of science um more quickly but it doesn't mean that i'm automatically kind of an expert in those areas and so I was, I was still really lost with my skin. And eventually I built up the guts kind of after work one night, I went to a pharmacist to ask for help, hoping nobody from work was going to recognize me. And I walked over to this guy who happened to have amazingly clear skin and um, asked him, what can I do for my acne? I kind of spilled my guts. And I remember what he said to me really vividly. His words were, there's nothing that can be done. You're just going to have to accept and live with it. And that was just such a heart sinking moment. Like those words just kind of sucked hope away from me. And I felt like my skin was going to be stuck that way forever. But that was my turning point when I thought, no, I know that's not right. I know there are things that can be done. My skin's been clear before it can be clear again. And so I kind of researched and researched until I couldn't research anymore. And I started trialing these changes that I was finding in the literature and with educated trial and error, um, I managed to heal my skin of the cystic acne that I was experiencing. And what was really ironic is the changes that I thought were gonna have least impact and I was most resistant to trying were actually the ones which had most impact for me. 
Um, so now I help other people get to the root cause of why acne is happening to them um, and, and heal that acne, which is, which is what I do today. And are we going to be talking about some of the things that help you the most? Or do you want to touch on that now? Like what were some of these key things that made a big difference for you? Yeah, sure. I think two key things for me. Um, one was that I was stuck in this rut of give me the strongest acne, acne skincare you make. Just give it to me now. I want rid of my acne and I want it to get rid of it really quickly. So I was using incredibly harsh skincare products. Um, which now knowing much more about the science of skincare like kind of makes me cringe to think what I was doing to my skin so so yeah one month kind of mantra I had completely shifted and actually it went from using the strongest anti-acne skincare I could get my hands on to being especially sensitive to my skin and only using products that are working with my skin's biology and I think that's really key to work with your skin's biology and the other was, um, it's a funny thing, skin, because I think skin, you tend to attack it from the outside and think because it's on the surface of your skin, that something you're putting on the surface of your skin is going to be most helpful. But actually, um, internally, why that acne is being caused is, is major. And for me, insulinotropic foods were a huge trigger for my acne. And kind of one of the major shock factors for me was how very healthy foods can actually be very bad for your skin so identifying what those were and eliminating and minimizing them in my diet just becoming a lot more educated in how what you eat does fuel your body's biology and and that can feed literally it can just feed and feed and fuel the acne causing cycle and could you expand on that term a little bit more? So what exactly do you mean um, insulin kind of stimulating? Yeah, sure. So um, actually kind of off of that question, I think it's worth mentioning. I get clients come to me a lot. I call skin, skin coaches come to me a lot and they say, but my acne is hormonal. Like, is there actually anything that can be done? And that question is so pertinent because it's generally not the hormones you think are causing your acne that are causing your acne. So sure, sex hormones are involved, but actually insulin is kind of the mother hormone on top of that. Um, and all the foods that you eat are broken down into your body, into sugars that your body can use for energy. And different foods are broken down at different speeds. So a food which is causing a large insulin response is getting broken down very quickly into sugar in your body. So that can be anything from the very obvious, like a cake, um, to the unobvious, like high glycemic index or glycemic load fruits, um, which is where the kind of eating healthy or natural foods, sure, that's really, really great, but some healthy and natural foods, for example, if you're eating a lot of fruit, can also feed into that insulin triggering cycle. Um, and the reason why that is so widely linked with acne is because insulin triggers off um, this kind of hormone process, which ends up leading to a lot of oil being produced in your skin and triggering off um, the acne cycle from that, which I think we'll, we'll go into in more depth later. And a really insulin stimulating food is dairy. So a lot of people are aware of the acne or skin issue, dairy connection, but even low carbohydrate and low um, sugar foods like cheese, for example, or whey protein, even though they're not high in glucose or sugars, they just have a very insulin stimulating effect on the body oh my gosh yes. yes and I think that one's huge especially the whey protein because you don't realize how many foods it's in once you start trying to eliminate dairy from your diet you look into all these food products and you're like wow wow like bing 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 you go in supermarkets like milk protein milk powder whey protein it's, it's kind of shocking but I think 
one of the reasons that's probably in so many foods is literally it gives you that it's like the sugars and the insulin response it just makes you want to eat more and more and more um so that can be quite revealing once you start looking at all your foods and it's also one of those points where if somebody's tried to go dairy free before they might not realize that they've been eating what look like small amounts of dairy in other foods but if you think of milk it's kind of like over 90 percent water so actually the protein in that for what you're drinking is quite small whereas say if you get i don't know a cake from the supermarket or a bread from the supermarket that has dairy in it but it includes dairy proteins that's the concentrated um so it's a much smaller amount in kind of a visual point of view but actually it's still a massive amount of, uh, of protein and milk and insulinotropic food that you're eating. Um, yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. Definitely. And I'll just put it out there that dairy isn't a trigger for everyone. So if you've gone dairy free um, and you've worked on all of these other root causes as well, and you've not noticed a difference at all, you add it back in, it's not a problem, then you may be one of the lucky people who can tolerate dairy. Um, I would just always make sure it's organic and as high quality as possible because there's going to be less antibiotics and growth hormones and things as well. But it can be a very anabolic, so like growth stimulating food. And that's why bodybuilders right, use sure. the whey protein. Um, and it could be good in situations when someone's very depleted. But if you have lots of inflammation and excessive growth of cysts and um, things like that then that's when you want to temporarily um, remove dairy from the diet so yeah, absolutely and I think if you even if you look at that animal kingdom as an example dairy is a food that is used to grow small animals into large animals and that's the same for humans really like breast milk milk dairy like everything is it's like you say it's got those growth hormones in it that cause babies to grow really quickly into toddlers and then teenagers um and actually our western civilization we've only through widely manufactured um farming like milk is is a large part of our diet dairy is such a large part of our diet today but it never was like 100 years ago it never was and while we're on the subject of diet, just very quickly, um, what's your kind of approach to diet or um, internal factors resolving them? I know it's a little bit different for everyone, but just what's your general approach with diet? Yeah, so I would say the one golden rule for diet is to keep your blood sugar levels balanced. So for every meal, especially breakfast, you want to be making sure that you're not triggering those insulin hormones. So breakfast can be a key trigger for a West, a typical Western diet. Say it's something like a glass of orange juice, a piece of fruit and a piece of toast with jam on it, which there's so many triggers there for acne. You've got the jam, which is full of sugar, which is a more obvious one. But then you've also got bread and bread, depending on what kind of bread you're eating, can cause a lot of insulin to be released. For example, even the glycemic index, it can be measured with bread as the reference food at 100. So it, it can really be very high in sugar response and insulin response in your body. So you really want to be looking to eat a super low sugar response diet um i would say in my opinion yeah the response you could be eating the same meal and i've done i sometimes use glucometer testing with my mm. clients especially if they have something like pcos or insulin resistance and it's very interesting to see because the same meal the same amount of carbs the same complex healthy squash or um sweet potato it causes a completely different blood sugar response but i think getting those key elements of high quality protein fat and fiber or carbs together in a meal and cutting out all of the refined processed packaged foods that's going to be a really good starting point but i definitely and also just simple things like how you cook food so it matters it changes the chemistry of your food so a sweet potato for instance if you bake that in the oven at really high temperature you're going to make a lot more sugars than if you 
poach it in a slow cooker, something like that. And you can physically see that, can't you? When you like caramelize yeah. it, it's like gooey. Um, if you bake the potato rather than like steaming it or something. So yeah, good point. I've not heard someone mention that before. So now let's get on to the steps. So let's say someone has woken up and after having clear skin for a while, the skin's now starting to break out and they start to try the dietary changes, um, but they start to look at the topical things. So the first thing on your list is they usually Google how to get rid of acne overnight. So tell us a bit about that and what are the common products that they use and is this a good or bad thing to try? Sure. So yeah, this is where I first started trying to heal my acne was dear old Google, how to get rid of acne overnight. And uh, there's lots of DIY hacks that you'll find. One of the most common ones I hear is baking soda, using baking soda, and then there's tea tree oil as well. So I thought it would be really kind of helpful to talk about the science behind those to understand how it interacts with your skin and why maybe it's not such a great idea and can ultimately end up making acne worse. So baking soda, for instance, baking soda can, can have a temporary positive effect, at least that's what it feels like in the short term when you start using it on your skin. And that's because it's increasing your skin's pH level. So that might sound really sciencey if I just kind of pause there for a minute. So pH is a ruler from zero to 14, and that tells us how acidic or how alkaline something is with seven being neutral. Your skin needs to be slightly acidic, and more and more studies are showing that the ideal pH level is around five or actually just after, just underneath five, kind of four to five. Um, and interestingly, as skin ages, your pH level increases and that pH level usually ends up about 5.5 to 6. And we know with aging, your skin health decreases and the rate at which it heals is a lot slower. So you can kind of see just from that example that having a higher skin pH um, is not helpful to healing your skin from acne. Now, baking soda, wait for this, is on that scale, pH 8 to 9-ish, which is firmly in the alkaline region. And that's going to, the more and more times you use a product like baking soda on your skin, the more times your pH strays, it's pushed up, and then your skin works to kind of quickly, quickly rebalance it down. But then the more times you use it again and again, you're causing more stress and your skin takes longer and longer to reacidify itself. And what is happening there is it can make your skin feel a lot less oily for maybe an, a few hours after using a product like that, which gives you that temporarily, excuse me, temporarily, oh my goodness, <laughs> temporary <laughs> relief just to feel that your skin isn't so oily. And, and, uh, and because you're drying your skin out, that can temporarily gosh, I'm just not going to say that word again. <laughs> it can cause for a short amount of time your skin to, to feel like you don't have as many active acne breakouts because oil does feed the acne causing cycle. But in the long term, it's going to make your acne worse. And that's because when you increase your skin's pH level all the time, you're playing with your skin's biology. And there's something in your skin called the calcium gradient. That calcium gradient helps your skin cells um, to mature through the different levels of your skin. So every new skin cell you have is kind of born in the bottom layers of your skin and you can't see it. So imagine that like a baby. And that baby over 30 to 60 days it travels through the layers of your skin and it gets older and it matures. And part of what happens during that process, the skin cell has a nucleus. And I know this isn't a very polite analogy. <laughs> Imagine this is when your baby, as it's maturing, it might vomit. So <laughs> the skin cell kind of vomits out its nucleus and that becomes material that helps your skin cells to pack together. Now, when a skin cell has lost its nucleus, it can pack really tightly and really flatly against other skin cells, which is helping to form a skin barrier. And that's a really healthy, healthy skin barrier. In the process of acne, 
you get what's scientifically referred to as follicular hyperkeratosis happening, which sounds really techy. All it means, follicular is like your pores, your follicles, and hyperkeratosis is a kind of skin thickening. Now, when your skin pH is raised, this maturing of your skin cells doesn't happen as it should do. And some of your cells might not lose their nucleuses at the time that they should do. Um, it might cause skin cells to proliferate, to grow a lot more quickly than they normally would. And all of this upsets that packing of your skin cells. And um, if you imagine like a brick wall, just uh, mortar joints being kind of pushed apart and extra bricks being put in in different places, it comes higgledy piggledy and this can cause a massive clogging of your pores. And that raising of your skin pH by baking soda can literally trigger that to happen. So not only do you already have that happening because you have acne, but using products that are high pH, like baking soda, directly feed into it. So in the beginning, maybe for a month, it causes your skin to feel less oily and you're like, yes, it's working. And it's drying out my acne cysts. And then the long term, it actually provokes more acne to happen, which can be really devastating. And it's not something that you think, okay, well, I started using that a month ago, it really worked. And now my skin's getting worse. It's hard to make that link between two months ago, adding a new skincare treatment to your routine and the condition of your skin two months later. Um, so I think that's something really important just to remember that sometimes skincare products can work against your biology, show you benefit for a short time, but in the long term, they're feeding that acne causing cycle. It could be the same with diet. Like you might add a food in two weeks ago and start to eat that and then you two weeks later start to break out you're like oh it must be something else that I'm putting on my skin or stress but it's actually a delayed response from something that happens so this is why keeping a journal or a diary to try and pinpoint acne triggers can be really important I definitely is there anything else you want to touch on from the DIY hacks that's like a really important one that people need to avoid or is that yeah like so I would say really quickly, tea tree oil is a massive one for acne. And the, the kind of, the, the worst thing you could do with tea tree oil is put it neat on your skin. And um, that's probably what the most common mistake I see people making. Now, um, the, the guidelines from the regulating authorities for cosmetics, they actually have have limits for the amount of actives that can go into skincare products. The guideline advice for tea tree oil is you should have no more than 1% in a leave-on skincare product. But the kind of Google DIY how to get rid of acne overnight hacks quite commonly rely on putting tea tree oil on your skin. So I'd say that's the most important one. Tea tree oil is actually a known sensitizer. So it's a mild to moderate sensitizer. And what that means is you could use it and it could be absolutely fine for a month or maybe even a year. But gradually, your skin is noting every time you've done that to it. And uh, it's kind of keeping a tally. And then one day, it's just too much. And it's the straw that broke the camel's back. And it just reacts. It becomes sensitive, sensitized, red, very sore. You could have hive-like breakouts. So I would say, yeah, be really, really wary of using DIY tea tree products. And if you ever do... Uh, want to use a tea tree oil make absolutely sure that you dilute it with another oil that's suitable for the skin yeah I remember burning my face <laughs> with oh, it and put no. it on like every night straight like after washing my face straight away I'd probably use scent I've scrub and something else first and then I put yeah. the tea tree oil for like a whole week um sometimes twice a day and then I had like these big red burnt patches on my face for weeks oh gosh I'm sorry you had to go through that I've tried a lot um yeah. but just essential oils in general um so I watch a lot of like dermatologist videos on YouTube and there's some people who are like really against any essential oil in a product what are your thoughts yeah, I would, I lean on the side of going fragrance and essential oil free for skincare that's treating acne. The reasons that I lean on that side is a lot of the time 
those ingredients are put in a formula more for a sensorial experience and when you're treating acne you it's a it's a medical condition so you want to be treating it as you would a medical condition and in my opinion that kind of sensory aspect to it um you can light a scented candle and kind of enjoy your skincare routine in that way rather than having fragrance in your skincare it's just such fragrance is a huge mix of many many different ingredients and even essential oils they're just a massive mix of lots of different ingredients and a lot of them are have potential to be allergenic or irritant or sensitizing so i my kind of policy is to leave that out of your skincare while you're encouraging your skin to heal itself does that make sense yeah and the term for everyone the term fragrance if it's not derived from essential oils it's just code word for chemical <laughs> over yeah. like potentially a thousand different hormone disrupting chemicals so i personally try to avoid fragrance products but those with like robust skin barriers and don't have any skin complaints they're the ones who can usually use them with no problems so if that doesn't work for people, they've tried the masks and the tea tree, maybe it helps temporarily, but then it starts to become less effective. Next, people usually turn to the drugstore brands who I know that you've worked for um, before, some brands like Clearasil you mentioned. So um, a lot of the clearing pads and the washes and the scrubs, they buy like the whole line of products because it promises that they're going to have clear skin and they're all oil free, they're all um, very stripping, sometimes containing alcohol. So tell me a bit more about some of the mistakes that are in these formulations. Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, I did, I used to work for a company who made Clearasil. Um, and while I, I believe those products can, can have a place for some people, maybe temporarily, using them as a long-term treatment for acne, which if you're suffering with acne, especially as an adult, um, you're not gonna, you're not gonna fix something in a month. It's gonna be a longer process than that. And these kind of skincare products, a lot of them, so it will start with something like a maybe foaming face wash. And that, <laughs> that beginning process that has such a limited contact time with your skin can actually cause massive damage so cleansers tend to be higher ph levels that are high foaming and they also tend to use what are called surfactants in chemistry and all that means is it's a cleansing active it's removing oils and grease from your skin and they tend to use cleansing actives which are a lot harsher so sodium lauryl sulfate is an example of that and actually in in kind of cosmetic active testing if you want to test a soothing active you purposefully irritate the skin with sodium lauryl sulfate so that just kind of goes to show how irritating it can be and using cleansers like this basically mess a really 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 mess up your skin barrier so it's causing that whole process we spoke about where it's raising your skin ph um, and causing all those issues with your uh, your acid barrier not being correct and the differentiation of your skin cells, so the weight and rate that your skin cells exfoliate off of your skin at. So it's causing all of those issues. And also it's causing an issue that as you wash your face, these surfactants can denature, so change the shape of your skin proteins. And this is like that brick wall we talked about before. You want all your skin cells to be tightly packed and flat. But if you're denaturing and changing the shape of those skin proteins, then you've got a brick wall where it's more like one of those country brick walls you see that might be very rural and uh, slightly ragged. Higgledy piggledy. Yeah, <laughs> I love that word. <laughs> so, and when your skin barrier looks like that, it basically can let in more irritants and they can kind of like surfactants even are an irritant and they can lodge themselves in between your skin cells and then cause all sorts of havoc and irritation so high framing face washes i would recommend to steer clear of and the second trap that's really easy to fall into is those spot clearing 
skin pads, which they usually tend to have something like 2% salicylic acid. Salicylic acid can be a helpful active, um, but in the spot clearing treatment pads, they're often highly loaded with alcohol. And that's because the active needs to be transferred from the pad to your skin and alcohol has a low boiling point, which means that it just evaporates off really quickly. And also it's a penetration enhancer. So it can cause that active to basically penetrate your skin barrier and get into your skin. Now there are lots of different ways in cosmetic formulation that you can encourage an active to penetrate your skin barrier. Alcohol is one way where essentially it rips off, strips off your oily skin lipids. So everybody's skin type has oils on the top surface of them. Even if you have a normal skin type that doesn't look oily, you still, still have those oilies oilies, oily layer of skin. Um, and that's really important to have. It's just when your skin is more oily, you're producing a lot more of those oils and those oils tend to be a little bit more unbalanced or, or oxidized. And when alcohol is stripping those oils off your skin, your skin barrier is kind of being perforated. You're pushing holes into it and those holes cause your skin to lose moisture. So your skin becomes very dehydrated and very dull looking skin can kind of very often be a sign of that. And again, all of your skin's biology is just completely upset. It no longer has a skin barrier that's helping it to keep irritants and allergens and bacteria out. So acne bacteria play a part in the acne causing cycle. And if your skin no longer has a, a healthy barrier, a healthy acid mantle, then all those bacteria along with lots of other what are called more opportunist bacteria, which can quite happily live on your skin, can suddenly have access to deeper levels of your skin and it can start to cause a whole cascade of skin issues. So I think it's often quite surprising to realise your skin naturally has a whole host of bacteria living on it. And those bacteria range from good to bad to opportunistic and it's it's an ecosystem that lives together very happily but when you start to play with your skin's biology it can cause that ecosystem to shift and all of a sudden the opportunist bacteria have an opportunity to cause havoc on your skin and that can feed the acne causing cycle it leads into that inflammation cascade so acne is a chronic inflammatory skin condition so anything that's going to cause you inflammation will help to worsen acne symptoms so definitely 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 please avoid high foaming face washes and any kind of skincare that contains a high amount of alcohol in it what about daily exfoliation so like people who scrub every day or products that are actually they say that it's designed to be used every day um, and also makeup wipes I want to know your thoughts mm. um yes so exfoliating can be a key pain point because if you most people who have kind of a classic anti-acne skincare routine, exfoliating will be a huge part of that. But very regular high strength exfoliation is incredibly irritating to your skin. And if you imagine that brick wall again, if you do it too often, it's going to make lots of holes in your brick wall. And that's exactly what we don't want to happen. One of the products I get asked about again and again, I don't know if you've heard about the brand, The Ordinary. Mm -hmm. The Ordinary have a high strength peel, a AHA, BHA peeling solution. And a lot of people with acne will come to me and they'll say, I'm using this. And I'm like, no, don't use it, please stop. Because <laughs> it's so strong. It's so incredibly strong. And because of that strength, it will be irritating. For some people who have a very strong skin, it's, it could be okay to use, but in people who have acne, your skin is prone to inflammation and any skincare product like a high strength AHA, BHA pill is just causing more inflammation to happen in your skin. So it's just 
fueling that acne causing cycle the right exfoliating products so there are exfoliating products which can be very gentle to skin used kind of every other night can be helpful but it, it's so personal it depends on your skin type how sensitive your skin is um, there's so many factors so I think the overarching conclusion in my opinion is steer clear of high strength acids when you have acne they just really long term do not do good agreed so next again if they try a whole line of products again they might work and then they don't really see any um, changes or they start to get irritation and um, red skin from the products they then can turn to a pharmacist a lot of the time to mm. ask them do they know anything about helping with skin and products like benzoyl peroxide, adapalene. So could you tell me a bit more about what pharmacists typically recommend and if you would also recommend them if they're a good or a bad thing? Sure. Um, benzoyl peroxide is something I was actually offered. So that moment that I went to the pharmacist and he said there was nothing that could be done, I was, I had a moment of pleading with him. I was like, no, that can't be correct. There has to be something that can be done. And he eventually reached into his back office and he said, he pulled out this panoxyl face wash, which is benzoyl peroxide. He pulled that out. He said, you can try using this. He said, but be careful because it can bleach your face. <laughs> so I probably bought that bottle out of embarrassment, put it in my cupboard and I never actually used it. But that is an example of a benzoyl peroxide face wash that is very common for a pharmacist to offer somebody with acne. Benzoyl peroxide can be helpful for acne and it can show can show significant improvement in skin. I have seen I have seen people clear acne with benzoyl peroxide. I've had skin coaches come to me, they've cleared acne with it. Um, because they haven't confronted their underlying triggers, it's coming back. Benzyl peroxide, what it does, it kills bacteria. It's actually a very, very potent bactericide. Now, part of the acne causing cycle is linked with acne bacteria proliferating, kind of growing on your skin. So there's actually a lot more of a complex picture than people realize. So a very common approach to helping get rid of acne is just to kill off all of the acne bacteria on your skin. And as you're killing off all that acne bacteria on your skin, you're also killing off all the good bacteria as well, which leads into just very poor skin health long term and is often why benzoyl peroxide um, can leave your skin feeling very unhealthy and dehydrated and dull. Um, now, actually, more recent studies are showing us that healthy skin versus normal skin has a relatively higher amount of what are kind of called acne bacteria. There are lots of different strains of bacteria within that, but we're called acne bacteria. So if you just kind of pause on that fact for a minute, like healthy skin has relatively more acne bacteria, whereas, ac whereas acne prone skin has relatively less. Um, if I just kind of talk you through an analogy for that so imagine if you're in a lift and that lift has two women in it and one man and they're quite happy pondering around in that lift and then we imagine another lift and that lift now has 20 women and 20 men in it so it has relatively less women than the lift with two women and one man but what is now happening is there are many more people in that lift and if you can imagine being stuck in that medium sized lift with 39 other people, it's going to be kind of probably as hot as it is today and as sweaty as it is today. And you're not going to be a very happy bunny about it, which is more of the analogy of how that bacteria is living on your skin and in your, in your follicles. Whereas benzoyl peroxide, what it's doing, it's just killing everything off without any kind of discrimination of what is good or bad. And that 
that process of killing everything off long term just is it's not working with your skin's biology at all and that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of side effects to using benzoyl peroxide and many people might find that it works for a short amount of time and then long term they start to get so many side effects of it that they can no longer continue to use it so it's very common for benzoyl peroxide to dry and irritate and redden your skin so it's another one of those those kind of it's easy to fall into using something like that because in the beginning you see that it works and you're like, oh my goodness, I feel so much better because my acne is starting to disappear. And then the longer you use it for, the more you get side effects. And then you're kind of left in this oily dry, oily dry skin cycle, a lot more irritation and then even more acne. So benzoyl peroxide, it can work, but I don't personally recommend it as a long-term treatment, especially. Is there a process that you need to go through to wean yourself off them? Because people can be very reliant on them and the skin can freak out when they stop taking them. So how would you recommend slowly transitioning away from the, the use of them? Yeah, for sure. So that that that's the key issue. Going cold turkey, if you've been kind of killing off your skin microbiome for so long and you go, go cold turkey, it, it, the rebound effect is is real so it should be a gradual process as with any kind of skincare change realistically you should gradually change any new skincare product for instance that you add in you should be gradually changing that in and out with another skincare product especially when you have acne i kind of liken it to having a sensitive skin type because your skin is so prone to acting out to irritation and inflammation and sometimes that means kind of tiptoeing around your skin like it's a sleeping two-year-old. So making sure that change is very gradual, reducing the amount of times a day you're using benzoyl peroxide, reducing the amount of days per week you're using it, and making sure that you're being very gentle in that process. Do you ever like either these medicated creams or like regular skincare products can stop working and being affected after a while or is that a myth like you need to switch up your routine every few months to keep your skin on its toes or is that once you find a routine that works you can happily stick with that yeah um there's it's it's a very interesting question there's not kind of a black and white answer to it there's first of all you can you can end up with that feeling you're using a skincare product like benzoyl peroxide because it works in the beginning and then the side effects kick in so that can be a reason why you feel like skincare has stopped working because actually it's working against your skin's biology then there's another way to look at it in that as you're improving the health of your skin there's this concept in chemistry called rate limiting step so as you're creating a reaction you have different I don't know if you imagine it as foods that you're putting in a mixing pot together you have different amounts and quantities of them and you can only keep feeding that reaction or that cooking by adding more foods into the bowl but if you run out of one food suddenly that becomes your rate limiting step and as you add that food in another food becomes your rate limiting step so sometimes it can be not that a skincare product has stopped working but that your skin needs something else it's very individual and the ways that you would tell what it is first of all would be looking at the skincare products you're using and if there are any of those kind of benzoyl peroxide working against your skin biology products um, and then looking at the person's skin history and skin health and skin skin condition so another reason um could be that you're using a product that is a bit stressful for your personal skin type that maybe you have a much more sensitive skin type and if that is causing stress it's going to cause inflammation in your skin acne is an inflammatory skin condition so it's just going to accentuate the acne that you're experiencing so i'm afraid it's not a black and white answer there's a lot of things that you'd have to look at within a person's skin history and skincare routine to be able to tell if a skincare product or a routine has kind of stopped working, I guess. So after this, people tend to visit their doctor, GP, dermatologist, because their skin is still an issue. Maybe it's spreading to the chest, the back, other parts of the body. Um, and the doctors, depending, usually recommend one of three things. 
antibiotics, birth control pills, or Roaccutane. So tell us a bit more. You can touch on one or two in detail, but can these sometimes be useful and be helpful? Or is it, again, just a quick fix and long term you're actually making the issue worse? Mm, good question. Yeah, so antibiotics have been very commonly prescribed with acne. I think everybody is now aware about antibiotic resistance. For example, um, there was a study, I'm just going to read you these stats. So the bacteria that live on your skin, the acne bacteria, there are resistant antibiotic strains of them now that have evolved. And that escalated in 1991. There was a study um, published in 1991. It showed about 34.5% of people carried a strain of bacteria, acne bacteria in their skin, which was resistant to antibiotics. So that's things like um, clindamycin. And then in the year 2000, so um, just, gosh, I can't even do mental arithmetic. How many years later is that? Nine years later, that had increased to 55.5% which like is massive. So over half of people with acne were carrying an antibiotic resistant strain of acne. Um, yeah, so that's just massive. So going to your doctor and receiving antibiotics or an antibiotic cream, it's less and less likely to work against acne. And in my opinion, it's not a very positive way to help treat acne because it's killing off bacteria. Antibiotics aren't very selective about which bacteria they kill off. You can kind of, one of the common side effects of taking antibiotics is that um, you'll get an upset stomach and that is all to do with it killing off bacteria in your microbiome. So it's not one that I recommend. Now, quite often, if you go to the doctors because of the antibiotic resistance that we're seeing, those treatment products are very often combined with benzoyl peroxide because there's that doesn't have the same issues with biotic resistance. Um, and both of those products, they're just, in my opinion, working against your skin biology and kind of covering up what could be a trigger cause, which we spoke about at the beginning. A lot of, of trigger causes for acne can come from the diet. So you can still be triggering your skin as you're killing off your skin microbiome to stop the acne lesions from showing, but you're still triggering it underneath. So when you stop those treatments, the acne will come back. And again, with birth control pills, it's very similar. So birth control kind of hijacks your body's own hormone creation system. And in doing so, it can help to turn down androgen production, which is linked to causing oily skin and therefore feeding into the acne cycle. But again, it's just like a band-aid being slapped on. It's like I don't know, if you had pain in your feet from wearing high heels, instead of taking those high heels off, you're taking a painkiller to mask that pain. And birth control is working very similarly just to cover up what's happening. And very often when people stop taking birth control, acne comes back a lot worse than it ever was before they started it. So yeah, in my opinion, I don't, I don't recommend those products or prescriptions to heal acne and then there's um Roaccutam, uh or tretinoin and that is a form of vitamin a vitamin a they're uh, retinoids and the way that that they can help to reduce symptoms of acne is they they kill off sebocytes so those are your sebum oil causing and creating cells and that is the reason why many people taking that as a prescription for acne find that their skin gets incredibly dry and cracked you can kind of get cracked bleeding lips eyes get very dry there are a lot of other side effects that are a risk when you take that as a prescription um i mean it's an interesting area because vitamin a is highly involved in the healing cycle of your skin but there are a lot of different ways to get vitamin A before you would ever consider taking a prescription like Rakutan or Tretinoin. You can find vitamin A in your diet. Um, you can use vitamin A or kind of low levels of vitamin A in your skincare. For example, there are retinoids, retinol, or gran active um, retinoid. 
But there's also a more natural alternative, which is called Bacuchio. Bacuchio is a natural retinoid alternative. It doesn't necessarily work in the same way, but it looks that it helps your skin to make vitamin A that it has more bioavailable. Um, so there are lots of different steps that you can look at before you would ever consider taking something like that from the doctor. And what are your thoughts about including a retinol in your skincare routine for someone who's in their 20s? Um, maybe they have, they're not using it just for acne, like anti-aging, we're hearing about the benefits. Is this something that you'd recommend leaving until your 30s and 40s? Or is it something that you can start in your 20s? I hear like differing opinions. Yeah, um, I love this question. It's a... Uh... Yeah, it's definitely one for debate. So I'd say, first of all, completely depends on the person and how they've taken care of their skin to that point. So a massive, for example, you mentioned they're not necessarily using it just for acne, but also for anti-aging. A massive aging factor for your skin is exposure to UV light. So that's one of the biggest ones under your control. And um, have you been protecting your skin against UV light damage? Is it starting to already show signs of UV light damage? So that's kind of something to bear in mind as a factor for when you would start to use something like a retinoid in your routine. Also looking at the genetic tendency of your skin to age. So looking at your parents and their parents, how has their skin aged and at what age did it start to show symptoms or give you a bit of an idea of when it would be good for you to start using a retinoid in your routine. Um, and also I think not overlooking when people go to anti-age their skin with something like a retinoid, not overlooking the simple things which can help to anti-age your skin, which which is being very respectful of your skin's biology using a cleanser which is ph balance to your skin's natural ph level as we talked about before with age your skin ph rises um and treating your skin sensitively so not causing it undue irritation and inflammation there's a process called inflammaging and this is basically talking to uh, aging in the body is inflammatory. So anything that's anti-inflammatory and helping to work against that process is actively anti-aging your skin as well. So there's a lot of approaches to anti-aging that can be looked at before you would incorporate a retinoid into your routine. And then there's also the point that there's many different concentrations and strengths. So you could start to use something maybe in your mid to late 20s that was a low level retinoid or a low level of vacuchial and then as years go on you could look to increase it but I wouldn't recommend it being the only approach you're using to anti-aging there's so many other anti-aging approaches that um, in my opinion have a lot greater effect and are more preventative um, always treating the treating the symptoms is going to be much less effective than preventing them and on the birth control point as well, I do have a, a ton of episodes on the negative effects of birth control and how to regulate hormones naturally, um, hormone-free birth control options, if people are wondering. And it can come back worse, like you said, because it's actually making underlying imbalances worse as well. Like it's impairing mm. gut health, depleting nutrients, causing more inflammation in the system. So it can be very effective in the short term, but for me if you're just doing it for acne then I think there's so many other alternatives so I definitely I, I was even reading I was reading a I think it was a paper the other day and it's kind of interesting to look at how birth control even evolved because in the beginning the ways that it were marketed are quite shocking so literally it would have claims like clinically proven to make your skin look better which just it shouldn't ever be a reason really that you take a long-term medication it should be like a very deliberated decision for a, a health concern rather than just for the selling point that your skin will look better if you take it so yeah it's quite shocking to look back on people are desperate though and I've definitely mm. been the, one of the reasons that I went on the pill in the first place was for my skin and my hair loss um, I didn't mm. have a period at the time and the doctor said that it would help to bring that back and I was like yeah I don't really care about that I, I want clear skin so I understand mm. why people choose it but at the time I didn't know any alternatives and people particularly struggle with the acne 
hormonally. So like at certain parts of the cycle, usually ovulation um, and or the lead up to the period. Is there anything that people can do around that time specifically to prevent or reduce the likelihood of breakouts? Mm -hmm. I definitely. So as I'm sure um, your listeners are probably aware about a couple of weeks before you get your period, your estrogen progesterone levels are dropping which means that testosterone relatively becomes more dominant and testosterone is that hormone that feeds your oil production cycle so in those two weeks before you get your period something if I go through kind of three quick hacks so firstly you want to avoid using products which are a lot heavier and more occlusive more emollient more moisturizing so that would be something like a night cream if you have a separate night cream in your routine that's just going to lead into the cycle of keeping that oil locked in your pores and clogging it and your skin if it has a has a lot of oil it's just kind of it's not going to be absorbing a product like that it's just going to be sat more on the outside layers of your skin and causing issues so a couple of weeks before your period i would recommend kind of avoiding those heavier night creams um i would also recommend there are some active and skincare products which can help block um testosterone being turned into a hormone which is about five to ten times more potent called dihydrotestosterone dht for short and green tea extract can be a really good active for helping to stop that so basically interrupting that androgen fueled cycle of your oil production becoming a lot more accelerated in those couple of weeks before your period And then also during that process, before you get your period, your body is going to be releasing many more inflammatory molecules. And that's happening in order to allow you to shed and have a period. So keeping in mind that acne is a inflammatory fueled skin condition, um, it can be helpful to use and incorporate many more anti-inflammatory skin actives into your routine, which just helps to counteract the inflammation levels at that stage in your cycle so actives like colloidal oatmeal can be very helpful for that also another one which i love it just has so many benefits for the skin niacinamide which is a b vitamin can be very anti-inflammatory and very helpful great and then i want to finish up now with just a few more questions so kind of like a quick fire round oh i like it First one is, what's something that you're into lately? So I thought we could put a little bit of a skincare um, spin on this. So is there anything like upcoming Ooh. in the skincare world, um, product developments, ingredients that you're into, new products that you're liking? Oh, oh my goodness. Good question. <laughs> uh, do you know, because, like, I'm just... I'm things coming out all the time. Yeah. I think from a, from a personal perspective, I'm just fascinated by the skin microbiome like all these bacteria that live on our skin and all of the findings that are coming out more recently like we know so little about it but already we can see such a a large impact of it on people's skin health i mean there's there's a there's whole studies so many microbiome studies it's not just the skin it's 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 people's much wider health. I mean, there's there's research studies into it in terms of how it impacts things like Alzheimer's disease and heart disease. And yeah, I think all these findings with, with the microbiome in skincare, you're starting to find a lot more like prebiotics that can be used in skincare to encourage the good bacteria to grow. Um, I think that's that's something that I've been really into recently. Amazing. Second one is what's one product that you personally couldn't live without? Oh, ah, nice than a might. I think, yeah, my all star, I call it an all star. Um, MVP, it's just, it's a, it's a B vitamin and it can help it can help get rid of acne or sorry, I shouldn't say get rid of acne. It can help to alleviate acne symptoms by that anti-inflammatory process, it's anti-redness, it can help to soothe the skin. Studies also show that it's an anti-aging active, so it can help to reduce wrinkle depth in skin. It can also help to even skin tone. Um, As skin ages, it starts to, it can start to look more sallow. 
and it helps to kind of even out that yellowing nature of the skin tone. If there's kind of any skincare benefit you can think of, there's probably a study that shows niacinamide can help. So yeah, any kind of niacinamide serum I couldn't live without. Love that too. And what are a few brands that follow your skincare guidelines? So not being too alkaline, not being too stripping. I know that Mm. products may vary um, within the different formulation lines, but are there any good UK brands that you recommend people look into? Mm, Interesting. Yeah. It's, this is a very, it's a, it's almost quite hard to answer question because many skincare lines have like a hero product Mm. that you would say is amazing. And then the other products in that range mm, could be good, but not so good. If you're, if you're looking, for example, for something that's very respectful to the skin and that you can get from a drugstore, CeraVe can be a great one. It's very, it's very um, cost, cost effective for the actives that are included in those formulas. That's a good brand to look at. Also, from a more active incorporated point of view, there are some products from The Ordinary which can be very good to use. For example, they have a niacinamide serum. There are also some products from the Inky list, which can be very good to use. And Niode is another brand which incorporates a lot of um, actives, which are very skin similar or work with skin's own natural biological processes to help improve skin condition. But again, I would say it's very, very much depends on your skin type and your skin concerns. Yeah, that's a great, I've never heard of the last one that you mentioned, so I'll have to look mm. into that for myself. Yeah, I'll send you the link. <laughs> great. And I'm probably going to have you back on at some point if you're open to it, to do like a, a part two. There's so many more things that we can discuss and probably um, there's going to be some questions, so maybe we can do like a Q&A part two. Um, oh, absolutely. I would love to. Thank amazing. you for having me on. You're welcome. Tell us finally, where can people find you online? if they want to get in touch. I know your Instagram page is really great and very packed with information. So let people know where they can find you. And I'll also link to these things in the episode show notes as always. Mm, So it's honestyforyourskin.co.uk. And I, as you mentioned, I'm also on Instagram, which is honestyforskin. Amazing. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. My pleasure.